Quet Mila Folcha. 100,000 welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Minister Costello, for your, uh, for your presentation and your kind remarks. And fortunate for you, tomorrow my program ends, so <laughs> you've not had to be bored of so many more of these occasions. Well, I'm very happy to be uh, with all of you tonight in Dublin and on the grounds of your prestigious uh, college. And as I said, I thank Minister Costello because he's taking um, time out of his busy schedule to be here and his wonderful introductory remarks and to share this important event. I want to thank the University College Dublin, the European Commission, the UNDP, the UN Development Programs for inviting me here to deliver the distinguished Kapuczynski Lecture. Uh, it's an honor for me, Madam Higgins, that you are here with your family. We had a great meeting in, in the President's house with the President and, 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 and uh, Madam Higgins and his advisors. Very interesting. I could have stayed longer discussing of all the so important issues. Uh, thank you, Ambassadors, for being here. Uh, President Brady, Register and Deputy President Rogers, Press Professor Farrell, Professor Walsh, uh, Dr. Connor Galbing, Ms. Nolan and Young, because your last name is impossible for me to, to, to say it. Many thanks for your hospitality. As the Minister Costello uh, just mentioned, uh, prior to my arriving here, I was in Copenhagen at the, we were at the Copenhagen at the initiative of um, this uh, co-sharing uh, governments of Denmark and Ghana plus UN Women and UNICEF for a global consultation on inequalities as part of uh, the ongoing discussion for a post-2015 development agenda. Um, I, I suppose many of you know, but for those who do not know, I mean, the, the UN has given uh, a certain uh, a development agenda that ends on 2015, the so-called Millennium Development Goals. So the discussion is what comes afterwards, and that are the kind of discussions that many of us has been involved, and of course the European Union is involved uh, very intensively. And if I may say, one of the things that we discuss on, in Denmark, because we are co-sharing with, um, with UNICEF on this area, is about inequalities, and I will explain why. Um, the idea in Denmark was to, on one hand, discuss about the new agenda and how inequalities can have to play a substantial role in how we look at the world and to, and the, uh, the, to tackle inequalities on the world post-2015. And, and I think, uh, and, and also because we believe that it's not only important what you want to do, but how you do it, to, to receive the report of global consultations on inequality as part of ongoing discussion for this uh, post-2015 development agenda. And here we have a key issue of our times, but it really is not of our times because since the founding fathers uh, in Latin America uh, uh, fought for the independence, they were talking about, and since the charter of the UN, we were all talking about how uh, we created a world that would be equal for men and women, for boys and girls that could have equality as a central aspect where human rights, justice, democracy, etc. will be the essential parts of, the, of, of humankind. But anyway, we still now, after so many years, still have that incredible challenge. And we enter the century with this century, when we enter to the century with great hopes. We enter it on the premise of the Millennium Development Goals, the so-called MDGs, to chart a more peaceful and prosperous way forward. But very early on in this 21st century, global events ranging from natural disasters to the profound economic and financial crisis and conflict set in and we find ourselves in a time of profound change and uncertainty. So today I wish to share with you some thoughts on key opportunities I see for us together building a 21st century that advances equality, peace and development. And my basic premise is that for doing so, we need to increase, to increase trust and the engagement between people and the leaders and institutions. We need to be inclusive. And I would certainly hope that this theme would resonate with the man in whose name we met today, uh, the Polish writer Richard Kapuscinski. Through his magical journalism, he explored power and he explored the always changing yet the so fundamental relationships that we call the social contract, that fragile yet imperative relationship for stability and prosperity, the contract between the governed and the governing. Today, 
skepticism about politics, lack of trust in leaders and institutions, and reactive, reactive rather, rather than proactive policy making seems to be a hallmark of our times. New technology, social media, questioning of the various paths of growth that societies have taken, the ever-increasing speed of events and more complex relations at the global level give the impression that events drive us rather than us driving events. There was a time when top-down leadership was a mantra. There was a time of belief in the power and authority of the leaders. If I'm convinced of one thing, it is that to manage today com the, the today complex challenges, leaders must first and foremost listen and actively engage all segments of society, engage people in problem solving. As the founding executive director of UN Women, and not just because of that, for me that means that the must is inclusion. And when we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about all kinds of inclusion. But we're also talking about including half of the world's population that has been historically uh, been marginalized. I'm talking, of course, about women, as you can imagine. Um, my saying is the 21st century must be the century of inclusion. And it has to include women's equal leadership and participation. Because I'm convinced that we will not be able to realize our goals for building true citizen democracies ensuring peace and a development that is sustainable and for all if we fail at inclusion. If it, will need, it, it will need all of us coming together if we want to come true the premise of the Charter of the United Nations. It is only by including all, by coming together that we can face the serious problems of human rights, war and peace, deep poverty and inequality and humanitarian need be it from Gaza to the northern Mali to Somalia, Sudan, Afghanistan, the Congo, or Syria. More than a quarter century ago, Richard Kapuscinski said, and I will quote him, society is asking to be more and more involved in the problems of the world, being active, being personally present, end of quote. The desire to be involved, to be active and personally present is not just a personal wish or a social, societal trend, that is a desire and the subject of the writing sense humankind and is a basic human right articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and elaborated in international treaties. The right to freedom of opinion and expression, to peaceful assembly and association, and to take part in governments comprise Articles 19, 20, and 21st of the Inter Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And these rights have been at the center of democratic movements in the 20th, 20th and the 21st centuries. These are rights, uh, these are rights that are, have triggered historic changes. These are rights that moved the Arab world as millions of men and women took to the streets to demand change. In other parts of the world, the so-called 99% made their voices heard through the global Occupy movement, protesting economic, political, and social inequalities. And today, as never before, people can come together in much greater numbers and at much greater speed and without borders through mobile phones, social media, interacting with each other and with leaders and institutions in new ways that few would have imagined a few decades ago. But, we ha but knowing all of that, the question is, have we learned to fully harness the positive, the beneficial potential of our technological progress to advance in that most basic premise of inclusion. Well, unfortunately, in every country, in every region, people remain excluded from the opportunity to play an active role in public life. They are excluded on the mere basis of their race, income level, in ethnicity, age, religion, location, sexual orientation, and gender, among other things. Ladies and gentlemen, my life in public service has taught me that we need to build on experiences. So I posted before you two concrete situations, two opportunities also on how we can work towards inclusion. I shall illustrate my point through the opportunities, the MDGs and the post-2015 agenda discussion present for all of us, and what we have learned through our work on the nexus of women, peace, and security. We express our deep concerns about violence in Syria and Mali, renewed fighting and population displacement in Eastern DRC, Sudan and South Sudan, continued insecurity in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia, the complexity of transitions in the Arab world, 
and the precarious recovery of many post-conflict countries where UN missions are preparing to draw down and exit. But many of us are also particularly concerned about this conflict, how it will impact, continue impacting on women's lives and women's rights and the squandering of the peace-building potential of half of the population. The percentage of women at peace tables or in the police and military component of peace missions remains in the single digits. So thus the percentage of post-conflict spending budgeted specifically to empower women or promote gender equality. And yet, millions of women and girls are displaced from their land, attacked on their way to and from refugee camps, deprived of education, marry off early, targeted and killed for defending human rights, sexually assaulted in detention centers or in their own communities, condemned to a life of indig indigency, and disposed of their livelihoods with their hopes vanished. We write protections for their rights into laws, resolutions, conventions, but a minuscule percentage receive justice or reparation for the crimes committed against them. We applaud women's grassroots organization for the role in promoting peace and reconciling communities, but we do not seem to have properly supported them and empowered them. Women's contribution to peace and democratization do not typically tr translate into leadership roles in decision-making institutions. In the five parliamentary elections held in countries with UN missions in 2011, there were either small declines or just a modest increase in the number of women elected. The result was an average of a low 10% of seats in parliament for women. Out of 11 peace agreements signed in 2011, only two included specific provisions for women. But at the same time, we have now a number of opportunities to improve our record. And I'm going to list five of them. First, the Secretary General's seven-point action plan on women and peace building sets out the most tangible sets of commitments to date across the UN system to create opportunities for women's participation and leadership in mediation, post-conflict planning, financing, governance, security, rule of law, and economic recovery. This includes a commitment to ensure that at least 40% of beneficiaries of post-conflict economic recovery programs are women and to allocate at least 15% of UN managed program funds in support of peace building to address women's rights and advance gender equality. When I first read 15% and everybody's so happy, I thought it was so low, but now it's 5%, so it's to triple it. And then I hope we continue improving. Gender markers are currently being applied by a number of UN entities and are likely to drive up the percentage of spending on gender equality in post-conflict recovery and humanitarian relief. So if first we have this seven uh, point action plan that gives a big opportunity. The second issue I wanna raise is that the UN has embarked upon its most ambitious effort to date to strengthen the availability, deployability, and adequacy of civilian capacities for peace building. As part of this process, we are undertaking the first holistic review of the way gender expertise is structured and deployed in post-conflict situations. Third, the Department of Peacekeeping Operation and the Secretary General determined to drive up at a faster rate the percentages of women in peacekeeping missions and in position of senior leadership. Fourth, there is a growing evidence of the strong peace and recovery dividends that could be obtained if we invest in women's empowerment. In many post-conflict countries, 40% of households are female-headed, and researchers have found that women spend up to 90% of their income on their household education, health, and nutrition, both during and after conflict. But I have to say, in countries without conflict, it's the same, 90% to the same issues. I'm not gonna embarrass anybody and mention the other half of the humanity, how much expense in health, education, and so on. In post-conflict countries with electoral gender quotas, women average 34% of parliamentarian. Most promisingly, Women's political representation leaps upwards once gender quotas are used, meaning that once quotas are established in one election round, women do even better the next time. So 2014 and whatever comes here in Ireland when the quotas start uh, being a reality. We also know that having more women leaders has a role model effect that enhances the perception of possibilities and aspiration for girls. And I always want to share with people the importance of role model. 
and, and this fantastic story of Tari Halon and the president of Finland. She was 12 years president of Finland. The president in Finland is like the president here. In Chile, the president is the head of state of the head of government, but in Finland, it's the head of state. And uh, she, when she was already nine years in office, she went to a kindergarten and she asked every little child, what do you want to be when you're growing up? And they answer the typical things that a six-year-old can answer, firefighters, uh, doctors, nurses, teachers, whatever. And then she went to a little boy who was very quiet sitting in, in a corner and said, don't you want to be president of Finland when you're growing up? And the boy very seriously said, in Finland, men cannot be president of the republic. <laughs> so I'm saying this because how important are role models and how you perceive how you perceive reality depends on your own experience. So that's why we believe that having more women leaders is very important also in terms of what little girls and, and, and what young people can aspire, who can inspire and aspire those girls. Increasing the proportion, for example, of female teachers above 20% has been um, shown that is correlated with the increased enrollment of girls in school and in some cases better student performance. And just an anecdote, also logistic is important, it's infrastructure is important, because we have seen that in school that do don't have a um, bathroom for girls and for boys, then many parents don't want to send girls to school, because those, they, they feel they are a threat on being raped or, 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 or elsewhere. So that's why it's so important when you're thinking on how you give opportunities to everyone and to think in a multi-dimensional way what are all the aspects that needs to be considered if you really want to succeed. Increasing the proportion of female police officers about 30% showed an increased rate of reporting on sexual and gender-based violence and this is an example uh, I mean increasing the numbers of women in the peacekeeper as peacekeeper first of all uh, helps a lot but also what happens is that when you have more women peacekeeper then when in those post-conflict situation uh, and, and comes the reform of the security sector, more women enter uh, are recruited for the police and the armed forces. And all of these are facts, facts that show progress, but it's very slow, the progress, and the progress is not enough. Yet this also shows us the possibility and how critical the inclusion of women is to building peace and security and above all, maintaining it. These experiences are not different from the countless examples of the 20th century in Europe with a story of countless unnamed women and their contributions to rebuilding. These facts also convey critical lessons on the type of leadership this takes. Allow me to turn to a further example, and that is thank that of the Millennium Development Goals and, and posterior arrangement. The process for the post-2015 agenda we are now engaged in provides, I think, a unique opportunity to place priority on inclusion and also to inclusion globally, not only for women, but of course also in terms of women advancing women's empowerment and gender equality. And as we already mentioned, we were discussing this in Denmark, because inequalities are and will continue to be the main challenge of our century. Extensive consultations were held worldwide, and we share, the, as I mentioned to you before, the final report of the addressing inequalities consultation. And this was just one consultation of 11 being conducted under the co-leadership of UN agencies as part of this post-2015 consultation. And what the report reflected, uh, an extensive global public contestation that was held from September 2012 to January uh, 2013. And I have to say, it brought many, many very interesting discussion. What have we already learned? This ongoing consultation with civil society, with women's rights organizations, with individuals from all over the world, using all kinds of te new technology, are a must and should not be a one-time effort. We're talking about inequalities. Therefore, dialogue and inclusion must be at the center of addressing them. Engaging people in development is not a procedural formality. It is our collective du duty. If we do not listen and work with people, we cannot shape shape, let alone implement a new development agenda. Because people are not beneficiaries, they are partners in development. I clearly stated that now is the time to listen to the voices of the people and of course to the voices of the women, to fully engage women and to make women's empowerment and gender equality a priority in the post-2015 global development agenda. 
And this is vital not because, I mean, of course, also because I'm the executive director of UN Women, but because women continue to face discrimination in access to education, work, and economic assets, and participation also in governments, local or national. And violence against women continues to undermine efforts to reach all of these goals. So clearly progress to 2015 and beyond will largely depend on success in tackling structural inequalities, ending violence and discrimination against women and girls, and promoting justice and equality. Moving forward, we need a framework that is universal, that is founded in the principles of human rights, inclusion, equality, and sustainability. By now, we have sufficient evidence that shows that promoting gender equality is a must if we want to alleviate poverty, reduce disadvantage, and drive progress in all the Millennium Development Goals. After a century of progress and change, it is clear that in societies with more gender equality, democracy is stronger, economies are more developed, and peace is a priority. Yet, to this day, the most blatant discrimination and abuse is still against women. While women constitute over half of humanity, they are far from enjoying equal rights, equal opportunities, equal participation, and leadership with men. And this exclusion, this discrimination, and this violence based on gender is one of the biggest obstacles, not the only one, but it's a very important obstacle if we want really to advance and, 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 and progress to sustainable development. When we look at the MDGs, what are some of the lessons that we learn? On one hand, we can say it was a very important step. We were able to produce global consensus and to focus on certain priorities. They contributed to unprecedented progress in a number of critical areas for human development. However, structural inequalities in its economic, political, social, or environmental domains and social exclusion have not yet been sufficiently addressed. And if we want to progress to 2015 and beyond, progress will largely depend on success in tackling inequalities, and, 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 and of course, uh, in all its elements. And I say this because since 1992, global economic growth has soared, I mean, I'm not going to consider the last crisis, but I'm saying in the long run, has soared 75% more than one in four people still, I mean, it has increased dramatically, yet more than one in four people still lives in extreme poverty. And social protection remains a privilege afforded to a minority. Today, about 5.1 billion people, 75% of the world population, are not covered by adequate or minimal social security. 1.4 billion people live on less than $1.25 uh, $1 a day. 38% of the global population, that means 2.6 billion people, do not have adequate sanitation. Almost 1 billion, 884 million people lack access to adequate sources of drinking water. And far too many people, and especially young people, are unemployed. And the persistence of such large numbers of excluded persons represent tremendous squandered human and economic potential and a threat to stability and security. And this is particularly important in a context of accelerated democratic aging in countries with low coverage of pension and health systems. It is important given rising inequality with the majority of poor people today for the first time in history of the world, not living in, 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 in low income countries, but living in middle income countries. 72% of the poor of the world live now in middle income countries. Furthermore, two thirds of natural resources vital to humankind are declining. And by 2030, it is estimated that the world will need 50% more food, 45% more energy, and 30% more water. And rising sea levels and climate change pose an unprecedented threat to humanity. So I think, and I'm not trying to depress anyone with these comments, I'm just trying to put which is the scenario that we all of us, and particularly young people, but all of us, that we have to confront. So I think it's safe to say that we cannot afford to continue on the present path and expect things to go well. But on the other hand, looking at this a little bit dark picture, now we have a real opportunity that we must seize to tackle the deeply entrenched cultural and social norms and discriminatory laws, practices, policies that, in the case of women, hold them back 
from reaching their full potential and contributing to a better world for all, but also to tackle all the inequalities that also affect men from reaching their full potential. If we look at just two MDGs, MDG 3, that is uh, women's empowerment and gender equality, and MDG 5, to improve maternal health, we get a clearer picture of what we need to move forward. For example, our target is to eliminate gender disparity in education by 2015. In too many countries, girls continue to be left behind. It's true there has been progress, but one of the problems with MDGs is that sometimes we look at averages, and the average is not that bad, but that's not true for the whole world. In Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, average in education and health, uh, the, the gap between boys and girls continue being high. While there has been successes in primary education, Adolescent girls are especially at risk of not finishing secondary school. And many factors contribute to this high dropout rate for girls. It includes cultural practices in family and society that impose constraint on girls' secondary education, domestic responsibility to do the course and caretaking, a preference to educate sons, and pressures on girls for early marriage. As a result, only 62 of 168 countries are expected to reach gender parity in, second edu in secondary education by 2015, I mean, a couple of more years. We have learned that the crucial, I mean, if we can say something where the future of humanity uh, is depending is on education, and still we see we're not going to achieve it. So we have learned that the crucial right to education can only be achieved by promoting and protecting girls' human rights across the board. In other words, it's not enough to focus on just getting more girls to school. That's important, but it's not enough. We also must tackle the underlying social and economical challenges that are ultimately keeping girls out of school. We must get to the roots of discrimination and expand equal rights and opportunities. If we go now to maternal mortality, MDG 5, the disparities in maternal mortality rates present another striking example of gender inequality. First of all, is the MDG that has progressed slower. While maternal deaths have declined in the past decade by 47%, um, we all know that 800 women continue to die every day from complications of pregnancy and childbirth. And 85% of these deaths occur in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia. Of all the MDGs, the least progress has been on MDG C, uh, 5 to improve maternal health. And there are clear graphs that speak volumes to, of the lack of this progress. It shows global health funding over the past decade going up and up and up, while funding for sexual and reproductive health remains flat or virtually stagnant. Analysis also show the large disparity that exists in access to reproductive health services. Access to contraceptive, I mean, the estimation is 217 million women who want to have access to contraceptive and family planning don't have access. So access to contraceptive and skilled attendance at childbirth differs dramatically between wealthy women in urban areas and poor women living in rural areas, but also poor women living in urban areas. And the same is true for wealthy women in rural areas and poor women in urban areas. And we know that as a group, it is young women who have the least access to the services, which is one of the main reasons why the number one killer the number one killer of 15 to 19 year old girls worldwide is complications of pregnancy and childbirth. We have learned that reducing maternal mortality is possible in every region and greater progress can be made if every woman can exercise her right to health, including the right to sexual and reproductive health, regardless of her age, income, ethnicity or location. So I think it's time to make women's right to health throughout the life cycle a global development priority. And as a pediatrician, I have to add that we must put a strong effort on stopping child marriage because uh, child marriage is in the middle of, uh, and usually is forced child marriage. These again are facts known to us. But one of the three critical lessons we should learn and that ought to guide our future action. First, we cannot be neutral. The state has a key role and responsibility to advance gender equality and discrimination and violence against women and girls through laws, policies, and programs. And states should make this as a complete priority. If I may add, every country can deal with inequalities in their own way because the situation country to country is different. 
but what is essential is political will. How effectively states can tackle inequality depends on political will. No country can advance inclusive growth and equality without protecting the human rights of girls and women to live free of violence and discrimination. It would take the full support of governments and the authority of the law to protect the hard-fought gains of men and women around the world, men and women who have worked and continue to work tirelessly to bring about changes in cultural norm and social attitude in the society. Second, to achieve true inclusion and equality, we must focus on the factors that place limits on women's participation in public life and actively promote equal opportunities for women in the public and the private sector. And this includes proactive measures to account for unpaid care work, to ensure women's equal access to resources, assets and decent jobs, and to institute temporary special measures, such as quotas, to place women in position of decision making such as local council, parliaments, or corporate boards. Third, states should institute a social protection floor below which no person can fall. I know you have another discussion, but I'm talking about 75% of humanity who have nothing to, 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 that could support them. But also when we're talking about social protection, for us social protection is a tool, it's not assistentialism, is social protection to improve health, education, etc. That means to empower people and to give them more opportunities. Every person has the right to basic income security and universal access to essential social services such as, such as health, water and sanitation, education and food security. And this is not only for the people. I'm so convinced and as president, well, I give a lot of importance on social protection system. I think that it, it supports people, of course but also economies, the economies benefit from healthier, better prepared and more equal societies. Leaving behind the poorest, the most marginalized is not an option for societies in which every person has the right to live up to his or her potential. So the post-2015 agenda will have to rely on a new social contract between states and citizens which prioritizes inclusion, equality and democratic participation. <laughs> Let me also add, dealing with inequalities is not only about what we do in our separate countries. We live in a world that is unequal. When we have unfair trade, we cannot improve the life of small farmers, even though we provide them with the best seeds. We need to deal with inequality at the global governance system level to ensure that inequalities are tackled. To achieve success in a new global development agenda, we need a unifying development goal on gender equality as a cross-cutting priority. We need to work together to deliver on the promise of more equitable, inclusive, peaceful, and sustainable society for all. Nothing more and nothing less. And time truly has run out to bury our heads in the sun. It will be at our peril, all of us, if we know the disruptive impact that growing inequality presents to people, communities, our societies, to the planet, and a peaceful and sustainable future. This is not a north-south divide. This concerns us all. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to present you with two specific observations, yet there is something that unites these two. I already presented you two, two different experiences, but there is something that unites these two distinct situations. And that is, who is going to drive this situation? What is the kind of leadership that we need? For me, part of the solution that we seek is the kind of leadership that will stand for it. People everywhere long for and claim or for legitimate leaders and legitimate policies. Leaders that find and, above all, carry out policies that give everyone a fair chance. Leaders that look past short-term gains and pave the way for a more equitable, more just and sustainable future. And that is the challenge to action. In the 21st century, leadership can no longer be by control and command. It is about listening and leveraging a response. Listening is key and leaders today have so many more tools to do so. Leadership has to strive for inclusion. The castles are burning down, the fortresses and moats are no longer tenable. Now is the time for openness and participation. Leadership is not a singular or insular endeavor. Leadership is about consultation and collaboration. And government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. True leadership is about participation and engagement. Leadership pursues equality. We can no longer pursue public policy that in effect save the best for the best and the rest for the rest. We need to advance universal values with universal coverage. 
education and healthcare, safe water, sanitation, housing, energy, for all. And this and work are not charitable contributions or uh, government handouts. They are rights to which every woman, every man, and every human being is entitled. So this is especially important for all, but especially important for girls and women, because today there's no society that has achieved gender equality. While many countries around the world have made significant progress towards gender equality in education, this glass is still half full. Women continue. I mean, one of the interesting findings is that education gives a lot of opportunity, but doesn't guarantee that a woman could be a CEO. I mean, doesn't guarantee huge more opportunities. Women continue to earn less than men, are less likely to make it to the top of the career ladder, and are more likely to end their lives in poverty. Leadership embraces diversity and integrity of societies. And true leaders strive to value and understand people. And for that, you need this, humility, respect for yourself and others, and a strong belief in the possible. During my life, I have had the privilege, as the Minister Costello told you, to live in service of shared goals for democracy, equality, and justice, first for my country of Chile and now for the women uh, of the world through UN Women. And that I have learned is that leadership is not an attribute. Leadership is a journey. It is important never to give up and always look to the future. This does not mean forgetting about the past. On the contrary, building on the past. On the contrary, the need for a better society is derived from lessons learned. In building a democratic nation, one builds on the past, moving forward with the sense of mission for a future that includes everyone and ensures equal rights and opportunities. And when I was Minister of Defense in Chile, before becoming president, and I, you mentioned that I always said that, oh, I, I don't know if you mentioned minister, but uh, I always said that I haven't been Minister of Defense, I would have never been President of the Republic because being Minister of Health, I was a caregiver, a woman kind of activity, you know? But being a, a Minister of Defense, it meant, okay, she can deal with the militaries, with her history she could deal, and she, could, and she was not in, a, in an inadequate position. So, um, but being there, uh, bef uh, my mission was to further reform the defense sector and to continue working to ensure the rule of law. Because you know the history of Chile in, in terms of that. By approaching this duty with hope instead of anger, um, it was possible to support the people, but also support the armed forces to move forward in a spirit of national identity and determination. We were driven by a shared sense of mission to overcome authoritarianism by creating institutions to uphold democratic values. And democracy is rooted in solidarity, peace, and justice, and democratic reform requires leadership with conviction, but it also requires equality and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Kapuscinski once said, and I will quote, the biggest contradiction in a growing world is that while experiencing a period of development and progress, the latter yields inequality. They greater the progress, the wider the inequality. End of quote. This is a matter of fact observation, but I would say we can and we must do better. In moving forward in this already challenging 21st century, I hold the position that we need to redefine what progress is. Progress is that progress where we measure how well we promote inclusion and reduce inequalities. I took up the position as the founding executive director of UN Women out of a deep conviction that the progress we need to see in inclusion will also have to push vigorously and with conviction for women's empowerment and gender equality. We're pushing for governments to agree on and then take measures so that women can access opportunity as leaders and fully participate in decision making, whether related to policy, social, economic issues, or environmental issues. We're pushing for women's equal opportunities in economies. In the economy, this demands a series of measures, such as providing childcare and work-like policies, ending violence and discrimination and sexual harassment, removing barriers women face to owning land or accessing credit. And this is our contribution to inclusion. Sustainable development will only come with every person can uh, really feel that their rights are uh, ensured and fulfilled. And now I ask you for your contribution. And let me conclude by quoting an Irish proverb, but I'm not trying to tell it in Irish. I was saying what they uh, translate me uh, in English. And probably it's not a good translation, but I think it captures the idea anyway. 
Your feet will bring you to where your heart is. And I ask you to show that heart and the courage to make this century the century of inclusion. Thank you very much.